Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my talk, Design, Lifecycle, and Architecture of Modern APIs. My name is Frank Mayfarth, and I work as a software architect and did my Master of Computer Science back in 1999. At that time, it wasn't even called Master in Germany. And I'm with Adesso since 2005. My main areas of work are actually banking, enterprise integration, and of course, API design development and rollout. Well, at Adesso, our philosophy is actually business people technology, and that's what my work is actually most about. Um, I try to bring together business and technology to enable people to enhance their business by using technology. Our business actually is based on mainly four pillars, which are actually business consulting, IT consulting, and then, of course, software development and IT management. And I actually work somewhere in between the middle two pillars between IT consulting and software development. Let's have a short look on some figures regarding Adesso. Last year, we actually made nearly 450 million euros in sales. And by March 21st this year, we had actually more than 4,000 employees. As a German company, of course, most of our offices are based in Germany and around, but we are also rapidly expanding around Europe. We already have um, offices in the Netherlands, in Spain, in Turkey and other countries. And um, that's going to spread more, I guess. But uh, now talked enough about me and about Adesso, let's uh, get in medias race and let's have a look at what I will talk to you about today. So, of course, I will talk about API. Um, and I will talk about its life cycle because um, that's actually an important thing when dealing with APIs. Um, because they went out of style and you get new refined APIs and you have to manage all of that. And last but not least, we're talking about architecture and have a look at what are actually important points in an architecture if you're dealing with APIs. And at the end, we will have a short conclusion. And um, just one thing before we start, of course, uh, since we only have an hour of time, this will just be a brief overview and not an in-depth technical session. Okay, then let's start with API. Well, API traditionally, yeah, well, it means application programming interface, and traditionally, it really was about how a one computer program can interact with another computer program or a piece of software. And that actually included real programming and a programming language. And the protocols used there were not really standardized in any way. And we still have that type of APIs nowadays, like in libraries or if we do remote method invocation or stuff like that. But that's actually not the type of API we are talking about today. Today, we are talking about APIs which are application programming interfaces as well. But they define more how consumers can interact with a piece of software. And that means that Programming in a programming language is not necessarily uh, involved here because a protocol most often is REST over HTTP, which is pretty well defined and is standardized. And because of that, you can actually use generic clients to access those APIs and try them out. And um, in a first step, you do not have to do actual programming. Of course, in real life, um, those APIs won't be used by humans, but by um, developers who incorporate functionality into their applications. But um, having a standardized way of accessing those APIs makes it much more easy to um, the public uh, developer to access uh, your business services in a nice and easy way. And as you can see, if you search the internet, 
be lots of APIs available uh, on the net, like Open Weather Map, Yahoo Finance, and of course Chuck Norris. So we're talking about API, and what's that actually really about? Well, um, the most thing it is about for companies is opening the enterprise to the outside world. Traditionally, company IT was closed, and it was really hard if an external party wants to get access to internal IT because it was not built for that. We use API nowadays to change that, and we actually need to change that to connect businesses in a standardized and easy way. And one really necessary thing about that is, since we do now have the technology and ways of um, opening the enterprise IT to the outside world, um, we need to do it in a consumer-oriented way. Because the services one company has to offer may be offered by any number of other companies as well. So we need to offer it in a way which is easy to use, which is fun to use, which can be used in the way consumers expect it. Actually, an API is pretty much like the developer front end comparable to a graphical user interface of a portal. If you build a portal and the graphical user interface sucks and is not easy to use, people won't use it. It's the same with APIs. If your API sucks and it is not easy to use, consumers won't use it, but will use an API of a different service. And one main driver, of course, is uh, digitalization. And as part of a digitalization, of course, the Internet of Things, because there suddenly we have a lot of devices which are talking to the Internet and which have APIs and which can be connected, offering a whole lot of new possibilities. So I talked uh, already uh, a little bit um, about the next topic, but I will go in more depth. Why is all this so important now? So and important one thing now. actually is so we do important. have very fast moving markets today. The way we do business is changing from day to day. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and Traditionally, we had infrastructures which were actually built on monolithic systems. And monolithic systems are like a tanker. And a tanker is fine if you want to bring goods from A to B and you want to do it every day, every week, every year, every decade, and you do not change anything. But cost change with a tanker comes at high costs and takes a lot of time. So we are moving away from the stru structure, monolithic structures to actually be able to um, um, react to that fast-moving markets. And we see that actually in IT projects moving more and more to clouds because what traditional IT operators discovered is when all that cloud stuff started, it's not that easy to host a private cloud. You can do that, of course, and there are big companies who do that, but it's not as easy as it seems in the beginning. It's not just like, yeah, okay, let's set up um, a simple Kubernetes clusters on my development machine and then we're done. It's much more to it. And that's why um, even traditional businesses are moving to public cloud nowadays. Um, and as I said before, offering APIs nowadays is really a business critical decision. Some years ago, Brad King wrote a book which uh, was uh, in its first iteration called Banking 2.0 and um, then there was Banking 3.0 and I don't know if there are more iterations by now. And what he said at the time was that banks will actually lose their retail business if they do not open their business to the internet via APIs. Because if they do not do that, then there will be other companies who offer really smart retail banking apps to their customers, and then banking customers will use those apps. And 
Of course, we all know that nowadays there are those apps and banks are eagerly to keep up with those fintechs offering that nice uh, shiny apps, which you can use to do your banking business. Well, I talked a lot about APIs, why they are important, what they are about. But if we're talking about APIs, we have to talk about one thing especially, and that is the REST paradigm. As I said in the beginning, REST over HTTP is the common protocol we use nowadays when we're talking about API. So REST means representational state transfer, but what is REST actually? Well, first of all, it is stateless. That sounds a little bit strange. As I just said, REST means representational state transfer, and the state in it, but you know, REST is resource based. And the protocol itself is totally stateless as it should always be, although uh, technology would allow for doing it stateful, but um, you should not do that because statefulness increases the, um, um, uh, the complexity of a system a lot. So if you can avoid statefulness, do it. So what does this mean, representational, representational state transfer, if you are stateless? It means that the resources itself you deal with can have a state, of course, but that state is part of the resource itself, and that's the difference. So at some point when you're designing REST APIs, you surely will create a resource model, which in many cases will be close to the domain model of your business. The next thing is actually which is special to REST is that you deal with URIs. And all of your resource may it be an account or may it uh, be a user record or a document. Every resource has a distinct URI to access it. And ex that's the URI you use for all the operations on that resource, to get it, to change it for everything. So that takes us to the next point. To work with those resources, you use HTTP methods and HTTP methods only. And of course, if you know HTTP, there are not that many HTTP methods and that restricts you, of course, but that, on the other hand, makes the protocol more easy to use because you always know that there are only a handful of operations, and if the REST paradigm is implemented correctly, then you know exactly how to use those, no matter what the actual business case really is. So finally, I have to say one thing, what is REST not? Because I encountered that a lot of times when people were saying to me, yeah, well, we already have web services, then we just switch the payload from whatever it was to JSON and then we have REST. That's not the case. REST is definitely not a JSON-based RMI. So, what uh, role does play JSON then play in, uh, in the REST paradigm at all? Let's have a look at the payload. Well, JSON indeed is most commonly used as payload in REST APIs, and there's a very simple reason for that. The reason for that is that we have a lot of JavaScript consumers to those APIs out there, because nowadays, most websites and portals are written in JavaScript like, with frameworks like Angular or React or whatsoever. The language of choice nowadays most often is JavaScript and JSON is native JavaScript and therefore, of course, um, JSON is used as payload a lot in REST APIs. But not only. You can also use XML as a payload, and it is even preferred if you have structured data and you want to process it, for example, with XSLT style sheets um, for transformation, um, to send it over to backend systems you might have. So XML is totally valid. And apart from that, 
Of course, binary data is used for uh, REST APIs because you have images, you have documents and stuff like that. And those are just binaries. And for those, of course, the REST paradigm works as well. And in the end, it works for any kind of payload because REST does not say anything about the payload at all. What it says is you work with resources. The resources have distinct URIs and you use the HTTP methods to work on those resources. Now, when we're talking about design of those REST APIs, uh, let me uh, tell you an example. Some time ago, I started refurbishing my home automation, automation system because I did not like the system which was built in it was very cumbersome and hard to use and hard to customize. And so I want to switch to a new system. And I chose one which was talking REST because I thought, hey, well, I'm an IT guy. I know REST. Why not take something which talks REST? I know that. So I installed it. And as you know, if you do home automation, one thing you surely have, you have a lot of actors with relays in it, which switch, for example, lights for you. So I wanted to access just uh, such a relay, and it was pretty straightforward, like I expected. I did a get on an URI, which in this case was uh, the host name of the actor slash relay, because it had several relays, and then an identifier of a certain relay. And what I got back was a JSON with the actual state of that relay. As you can see, the first attribute is on was false, on the light was off. So everything was exactly as I expected and was exactly uh, designed to the rest paradigm. Then, of course, I wanted to turn the light on. And I thought, well, to the rest paradigm, I take this JSON, set the attribute is on to true, and do a put. And I tried this, and I got back a 404 which means resource not found, which is actually not true because before I did a get and I knew the resource is there. It does not even, tell, uh, it does not even use a proper HTTP code um, to tell me that this method is not allowed. After that, I tried a post uh, with the same result, actually. And then I read the manual. Of course, I didn't read the manual in advance, because I'm an IT guy, I do not read manuals. But um, reading the manual, I found out how to switch the light on. And actually, it's working like this. And this is not REST. So I had to, add a, I had to do a GET to get a resource. And I had to add a query parameter called TURN and set it to ON. I could have also set it to OFF and TOGGLE to change the state. But that's not REST with a GET request. You should never change the state of a resource. At least I got the resource back and the state was correctly uh, in the resource and the light was on, but this is definitely not REST. I wondered why they actually did it. And I believe they did it for one reason. For everything which is not GET, you need some sort of generic REST client or write a program to do puts and posts in the proper way. But a GET, you can uh, set up in every browser. You simply write that into the address line of your browser and then you're off to go. And I guess they did it for that very reason because this way really everyone is able to do those calls and not only the guys who have uh, REST uh, clients to do it properly. Well, as I said, we only can use HTTP works to, act, uh, to uh, work with our resources. And there are, of course, borders then, and let's have a look at those. So searching is one thing, but searching is easy to solve because, well, if you search for something, you want to get something, which is a search result. 
and you can add query parameters and if you search your queries so that's fine searching most of the time is done through get requests which appropriate query parameters although many people think that it would be more nicely if there would be a search verb defined in http well then versioning is a thing it is not defined by the REST paradigm how to do that, and by the uh, neither it is by the HTTP protocol itself. And most people actually do it either by a portion in the URL, which is not quite a REST conform because then the version is part of the um, resource URI, but well, it is fine in a way. The other way to do it is through header information, and actually, if you search the internet, there are some people preferring the one and other the other. Mostly, they do it one or the other way. And then there are states. Well, as I said earlier, they are explicitly banned by the paradigm. I have that on this slide because I want to say again, avoid them at all costs. Because complexity ri really rises if you have stateful applications, and you can design RESTful applications without having state server-side states. It is not really necessary. There are only very rare cases where you probably would need that. If you need states, try to bind them to resources, because resources, of course, are allowed to have states. So I talked a lot about APIs now, and um, I could talk about APIs a lot longer, but we do not have the time for that. So before we go on to the next topic, I want to talk about guidelines for designing APIs. And as you might know or not, Zalando actually provided a very reasonable basic rule set. Um, they really sat down and write down what you should think about when designing and working with APIs. And if you read that manifesto, then at many points, if, you exper if you're an experienced developer or API designer, you think, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah, why would anyone do that in another way? But they were the first ones who actually wrote it down. So. The Zalando guidelines for API design and development are a really good starting point. But in the end, it's your API, it's your rules. So most uh, companies I know adjust those rules uh, for their needs. But I just want to say, if you do so, act with reason and try to stick to the paradigm as close as possible and move away from it as little as necessary. Okay, then let's move on to our next topic and let's have a view of the actual life cycle. And that is actually the life cycle we use at our customers um, when we are designing and developing APIs from the start to the really end and then again. So let's have an overview. Normally you start at the top and you develop an API strategy and then it's going around through an ideation type, a prototyping phase, a development and test phase. Then you do some piloting with friendly users and then finally you go live and then you start again. You have to look at your APIs, take your lessons learned and do the refinement and turn around. So let's have a look at those six points we use um, in our API lifecycle at Adesso. So first, as I said, we start with the API strategy. What we normally do there is we try to align, of course, with the general digitalization strategy of the company. And of course, we have to align with business development because an API strategy has always to do with business. It is about thinking about what are the guidelines we want to use, what are our business goals, where do we want to go with APIs. So the result of this phase typically is some sort of API strategy guidelines and a definition of goals. 
after that, we go to the ideation phase. And in the ideation phase, we actually look at concrete business processes. We really look at business processes and see, okay, if we have an existing business processes, how could APIs help this process to be digitalized? How can APIs help to make this process easier to use, easier to work with? How does a process probably need to be changed to um, have APIs um, incorporated, which then can be used by outside parties? So what we normally do in this phase is actually, first of all, we have to identify the stakeholders. We have to talk to all the people who know the process and who know how this stuff works. We have to do the requirements engineering. We have to identify which API, where APIs could actually be connected to the process. And most of all, because we normally want to make money with our uh, APIs, is we have to define the actual business value of um, having APIs in a process so that we can show how um, this APIs will benefit our business. And then finally, we define a domain model from which we will later on derive a resource model. And what's actually coming out out of this phase is the actual API design, which of course needs to fit for one thing, the strategy defined before. And at this point, we have a first look at does it fit the technical infrastructure of a company? Because if it does not do that, then we can make no use of the API. And then we go into prototyping. And into prototyping, we're not starting developing services or something like that. We're just dummy prototyping those APIs to connect them to the process to see if what we thought of in the ideation phase, if our ideas actually work out, if we try to work with that process with real prototypes, and there we will identify constraints and boundaries because we have to verify certain fits here. We have, for one thing, verify if I use those APIs, do they does my idea actually fit the consumer needs? Can I use it in the intended way? Then I have to do the technical fit. I have to talk to the IT department and see, hey, guys, can we connect those APIs to your systems in some sort? Is that possible the way we um, come up with the ideation phase? And finally, of course, we have to do the functional fit. So is the business logic behind those APIs, does it work out? Does it work out in the process? So if we have all that, then the end of prototyping should actually be a technical specification with which we can then start on the development and test phase. And you might wonder why we didn't separate the development and test phase. And the main reason for that actually is that we said development and test has really to work close together. Because you need to have very close cycles here to have, a, to have, have a real working software fast and have make real good progress with high quality software. So. Let's see what we do in development and test phase. Since we already have the contract now, because the contract has been uh, developed and hardened on the ideation and prototyping phases, we of course do a contract first development approach, which actually allows you um, to have consumers already trying out um, those contracts and uh, developing clients um, against them. Then, um, as I said, we try, always try to do very short and agile development cycles so, because then we can really harden our software and get a great quality software in a short amount of time. If possible, I always recommend try a test-driven approach here and um, incorporate or early feedback. So if you have the chance to have a real consumer look upon a test or asking them questions about it, do it. Do it all the time. You see 
if you see this um, life cycle painted here, it is a cycle, but there are sub-cycles in it. It is possible that during development and test, we encounter things which need us to go back to prototyping or even to ideation. But if we encounter such uh, issues, then go back, take a short cycle and restart again. The faster you are in this process and the faster you are in cycling, the better is your chance to get a real working software quickly. And that's actually what should come out of the development and test phase. And then before we go live with our software, we always recommend to do a pilot phase with friendly customers. Because for one thing, you do not um, have to deal with issues which are about lots of customers uh, on your platform, but also um, you can have a real life early feedback without um, consumers which will actually going uh, to go uh, fr frenzy on you right away because you are still in the pilot phase. But the pilot phase with friendly customers is really important to then harden your APIs because then for the first time, they are probably connected to real consumer systems. So this is very important. And what will come out of that is, if you do it right, is actually um, not only a working uh, API, but a consumer-oriented and really usable software which your consumers hopefully then will really like, and not only your pilot consumers. And um, that is what is so important, that when you go live now, that you have something which your consumers actually like and want to use, and probably tell other customers about, and then they will use it as well, and maybe tell even other people about, and they will become your customers. So... Going live nowadays is not as easy as it is in the old times because you have very distributed systems. You may have hybrid clouds with public cloud, cloud, private cloud. You have legacy systems. And if you have complex application, they are all working together. So you really need a good automated deployment process for that. And you really need a good monitoring and alerting for operation overall the systems you have uh, because otherwise uh, your operating will get lost here and then the most important thing during operations and all the obvious stuff uh, during operating such a system like uh, scaling and security and all that stuff is actually take your statistic take analysis talk to your customers, try to get feedback all the time, not only during pilot phase, so that you can really gain insights for the refinements of your API, and then you start all over again. Often you do not start with API strategy right again, but go directly from go live to ideation again. But um, if, an API, if an API is published, then you should more or less immediately start on refinement. You always have to have a look on your APIs and see what can we do better? How can we better uh, our APIs? Because um, the others will do that too. So um, if you don't do that, then others will have better APIs for the job and then you'll probably lose customers. And that's the simple reason for doing that. So this really is an ongoing process. So, moving from API to actually architecture. And when we're talking to architecture, um, well, we talked about API, but to be honest, the API itself is just a contract. So, the API it's just the tip of the iceberg. But to make APIs work, there's a lot of stuff underneath. Of course, typically you won't have all those layers which are on the slide. 
I just put on a lot of different layers you probably may encounter in a real life application, maybe some of them, uh, maybe uh, only few of them. That depends, of course, on the type of application you have. But nevertheless, it's never just APIs. There's always something below it. And the these layers need to work properly together. Otherwise, your APIs will suck from a technical perspective. They will be slow. They will be um, they will be inaccessible. They will be um, hard uh, to use. All that stuff. So the layers below your API need to be sound as well. It's and it's not just if you looking into API management. If you look into microservices tutorials and stuff like that, you some you sometimes could really think that it's just yeah, okay. I'm just writing a service, and um, then I put my uh, YAML file, for example, of that's how I um, define my API contract to my API management platform, and then I'm done. Yeah, and well, um, on a playground, that's, of course, pretty easy to go. And um, if you're on a greenfield scenario, then that's maybe working out because then everything is new and shiny and you do not have any legacy systems. You have no constraints and maybe it is just like that, that you just build a um, bunch of services connected to some data layer and um, you have API management in front of it and that's it. That can be in a greenfield scenario, but my experience actually is that in real life, you are dealing a lot with brownfield scenarios. And if you're dealing with brownfield scenarios, then you do have an existing infrastructure and it applies constraints on you. You have technology gaps which have to be bridged. Maybe you still have a mainframe or something or some old software which is running on a desktop uh, server below one's desk and no one dares to shut it down because no one knows what actually will happen if it's shut down. And um, that's not a joke. I actually encountered situations like that. So um, your technology selection may be limited. There are companies which, for example, say, okay, you may use open source maybe, but only if there's enterprise support for it or something like that. And in a brownfield scenario, often the complexity is actually not coming from your application itself, but from the environment you're working with. So in a brownfield scenario, there's a lot of things you need to look at um, which increase your complexity and which makes development harder than when you can simply um, choose what you want and work with the tools you want in a greenfield scenario. And that you always need to keep in mind when we're talking about architecture. And that's where additional layers come in. So now let's talk about legacy system in particular. Most legacy systems come with technical risk because they may use old technology like file-based uh, APIs or some RMI or, yeah, well, queues or something which is uh, pretty easy to handle in the end. But all those stuff is coming in and you probably actually need sophisticated integration techniques. When I started an integration, an enterprise integration projects a few years ago, a fellow architect said to me, you're starting an enterprise integration project nowadays. We're all building microservices. We don't need enterprise integration anymore. But the point is, if you're dealing with legacy systems, you need to integrate them somehow into your microservices world. I agree that you do not need monolithic traditional ESBs anymore because what we build nowadays to integrate those is actually 
what I like to call micro integration components. They are not services, but they are components running, if possible, on microservice environments on container platforms. And we use them to integrate those. But in the end, you need to do something with those legacy systems to connect them with their new and shiny world. So let's have a look at those layers I talked about before. Let's start with the consumer layer. At first, you might think that we do have a little access to the consumer layer because the consumer layer is actually what our consumers implement to use our API. But, of course, we want the world to be easy with them. It should be easy for them to work with our APIs. And therefore, we should offer them such easy ways. We should probably offer them guidelines on how to build clients, stuff like that. So we have influence on the consumer layer because we can talk to all the consumers of our API and tell them what we think is the best way to use our APIs. Have tutorials, have examples, have support. That's how we make API usage easy on the consumer level. So, and to do that, some things are actually really necessary. First of all, we have to know our consumers and we have to know their way of working because otherwise we do not know what help they need to use our APIs. And making it easy for them to use the APIs, I, can, I cannot say it often enough, is crucial to business value and success. So get them involved early. The next layer you will surely always help have when dealing with APIs will be the API management layer. And when we're dealing with APIs on the API management layer, we often distinguish between three types of APIs. We do have private APIs, and private APIs are actually just for in-house applications. They are never published to the internet. And then we have partner APIs, and often they are built on those private APIs, but they do not show all the data probably, or they are tailored to a partner's needs. And partner APIs often are available through a VPN to our partners, or even through the internet, but then only to partners and not to the public. And then, of course, we do have public APIs, which at least theoretically are available to everyone. So how do we manage those in an API management layer? So most API management platforms consist of three components, the API portal, the API manager, and the API gateway. So let's have a look at those three components. Well, the API portal is actually the entry point to our consumers. That's where they can find APIs. That's where they see which APIs we offer. That's where they find documentation, where they find support, and where they can um, actually subscribe to payment plans to use our APIs. Maybe we offer limited APIs for free, and then we offer premium APIs uh, for pay, uh, with a payment plan. And all this is handled in the API portal for our consumers. On the other side, there's the API manager. And that's actually the control center. That's what our API designers use to install their API contracts, to define which um, payment plans are actually the available to the consumers. That's where you have reporting and analysis. And last but not least, the API gateway. And the API gateway is actually the technical component, which is actually the runtime component, which controls access to our APIs. So this is traffic management, access control. This is where versioning is handled at a runtime. Um, and Depending on the product used here, you may have already um, integration implemented to connect to several legacy systems. For example, what such a gateway most often can do is translating SOAP into, yeah, well, let's say REST, because SOAP, 
mostly is not resource based, but is more RMI like. So if you simply uh, translate SOAP to REST, then it's what I called earlier JSON based RMI. But if you have SOAP, which is a uh, resource based from design, then you could use such an integration out of the box with most uh, platforms to um, have a REST API, a real REST APIs uh, as well. So next layer you will certainly have is a service layer. And if you deal with service layer, I talked about microservices before. And well, most people see microservices like a containerized platform where you simply have a lot of services. And if you need some service, you just build it, put it into a pod and deploy it to your Kubernetes or whatsoever. And of course, that is right. But um, if we're talking about architecture, you will soon discover that the services you build fall into different categories. You will have consumer services, which are really tailored to your consumer's need, because at the front end, so to speak, you want to have services which do actually cling to those nice and fine APIs you designed. Beneath that, you will probably have a layer with business services, which actually have all the business uh, uh, logic uh, within your company, and which normally um, are not exposed to the outside world directly because they hold much more data than you probably want to expose to your consumers or your consumer you want. So these are really the services on the business uh, layer. And then below that, you will have system services which are very close to all those legacy systems and other applications you have in your company um, and connect to those. And below that, you probably do have what I before called integration components. On this slide, I call them integration services because it fits better. But often those are actually uh, Apache Camel routines uh, running in a containerized platform as well, which are really about getting data from one system to another. And there are all those cumbersome and obsolete ways of moving data involved like file-based APIs, MQ-based APIs, and all that stuff you might have there in your existing IT infrastructure. So if you have such services and you have these different layers, it becomes obviously that you at some point start to organize them as service meshes like Istio or whatever mesh you like, but that's very likely to keep control about what you actually have. And as I said earlier, you will surely run those services on a containerized platform like Kubernetes or something which builds on Kubernetes like OpenShift. Um, there are a lot of options nowadays. Maybe um, you have the option to go to the public cloud, which makes it much more easy in most cases. So, but in the end, you can host it everywhere. You can host it private, public, or hybrid. I would not recommend um, to host your services on a monolithic server um, because of the problems we have there with scalability and stuff. Those times are gone, I guess. And as I said earlier, you will need a tailored deployment process for those. That's for sure, because otherwise you will get lost. But the good thing is most of those container platforms nowadays offer deployment tools to make deployment even to hybrid clouds where you have different clouds on different providers um, really easy. So let's have a look at system and integration layer. As I said earlier, um, you will need to integrate systems. And most of those will not even be services we often do that with Camel, and we then have micro integration units, which actually integrates only a few systems together, and then we have a lot of them. Because this way, and that's the difference to a real ESB, is if you have that on a containerized platform, you really can scale the integrations you need to scale, and you do not need uh, to scale some monolithic ESB vertically. That's the main difference here for us. And one other thing for such a system and integration layer, of course, is 
that you are able to uh, unify your domain model because when you build APIs, you will want a unified resource model and your existing IT infrastructure might not have that. And this is a chance to unify your domain model at a very low level. Well, then last but not least, uh, you have existing applications, which might be microservices application or monolithic application. They might talk SOAP. You may have queues, files, remote method invocation whatsoever. And you need to integrate those two. And those are systems as well. And maybe you write new application, then hopefully uh, microservices and not monolithic ones, but you will do so. And those will be part of your um, overall application as well. And maybe you have third party applications you need to incorporate. In rare cases, and um, I'll be brief on that one, you will also have a process layer. Process layers are great for two things. If you need to have uh, business processes, then you can model them in BPM and have a real workflow engine. Never try to model a whole application flow in a workflow engine. I have seen that a few times and it has always been a disaster. But if you have explicit business processes which can be modeled in BPM, then that's a good option um, to have them in a workflow engine and connect those to your and to, to connect that one to your um, actual services. If you have vast data scenarios, like in big data scenarios, workflow engines never work out. I've never seen that the classic workflow engines work out in such scenarios. Then it's better to derive state on demand from the data itself so that you have data-driven processes and data actually defines the process state. And then we have to talk about one thing and that's the transport layer because that's something we talk a lot about in those architectures nowadays. Because traditionally, we are working with transport layers like batch processing or files moving from A to A, or we have transactional databases which are pretty reliable and of course faster than batch processing and working with files. We may have message queues but we have more and more situations where we need to process lots of data in real time. And then we're talking about infrastructures like event sourcing, streaming, Kafka is the de facto standard here. And then we need something like that, especially for example, for decoupling slow systems, so that slow systems which are connected to our overall infrastructure does not tear down our complete infrastructure. That's what those fast track systems like Kafka come in. But all the time, go act with reason and decide, really decide um, each time new what is the real way to go for transport. Sometimes a relational database is just what we need. Sometimes batch processing is just what we need and we do not uh, need to do everything um, via a Kafka stream, really. So, and yet now we're really getting to the end because at some point we will have data and we will have a data layer. And as I just said, relational data is not dead. We will have relational data. We will have data warehouses. We will have operational data. We will have application data and that will be structured in tables because there is data which is really made for be stored in such a way. But of course, we know such way of storing data has its drawbacks and that's why there are other ways of storing data, like new SQL databases. I mean, if we work with documents like JSON, XML, et cetera, a lot already, then of course, um, it is not far-fetched to put the, those in a, a NoSQL database, which is document-based, because we already have those documents. And most of the time, um, using something like Elasticsearch to be able to have quick searches um, over those documents is just what we need. 
And if we go to the big data side, then of course we are probably dealing with data lakes. Um, but normally, not like in this picture, you won't have just one data lake with unstructured raw data, but you will have processes to refine that data and have several data lakes with uh, several refinement states. But in big data scenarios, you will surely um, deal with those sorts of data layers as well. So finally, um, after talking about a lot of different layers and what they are about, um, we now really come to the conclusion, because I've talked about a lot of stuff and this has all, this has just been a brief overview about stuff you will encounter in the API life cycle. And so now I'd really like to summarize for you um, what are the things I really want to say and I really want you to remember from this talk. So first of all, APIs are not just about the APIs itself. There's a lot more to them, and there's even a lot more to them than just a bunch of services running on some container platform. If you're dealing with APIs, I really advise you, focus on consumer-oriented design. That's really important because if your APIs are not easy to use, if they are not working properly, People will not use them, and there will be other APIs, and they will use those. Always think about the business value. If you build an API and everyone likes it, but you do not make any money with it, there's no use to you for it. Business value, of course, does not essentially mean making money through a subscription plan. It can also mean, I mean, like, for example, the big companies, they offer stuff for free, but they collect data, and then the business value is collecting that data. But there always should, of course, be a business value. Otherwise, there's no use in developing all that stuff. The next thing is make your refinement cycles as short as possible. Try to get the focus on your APIs small. You can build big systems, but try to focus on small portions of it so that you can have short refinement cycles on those and not big refinement cycles like we have in the old days when we had releases once or twice per year because then you cannot react to changing markets. So, and last but not least, always try to have a holistic view of the whole API lifecycle. Don't focus on one bubble of it because everything has to work together to make your APIs work. If you um, leave something out, if you design the best APIs ever, but the infrastructure below it is not able to handle it, then your APIs will suck as well. If your APIs are not designed well, but your infrastructure is great and everything is fast, people won't uh, do not want to use it. If people complain about little things in your APIs and you're not able to react fast to the needs of your consumers, yeah, well, you have the same, very same problem. So all of the steps of that life cycle are actually important. So now um, it's uh, five o'clock and I'm done with my talk. So um, I'd say we're at the... <coughs> A Q and A session. So, if you have any questions to me, now's the time.